Good evening, and welcome to Tuesday, January 21st, 2020's uh, uh, business meeting of the Olympia City Council. For the record, we have a quorum with council member partially excused. Uh, before we approve tonight's agenda, I need to note that we're pulling item 2B for future action on February 4th. With that, I need a motion. So moved. Sec I need a second for the agenda. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Takes us to special recognition this evening. Item 2A is recognizing the 50th anniversary of Ballet Northwest. And our very own Kelly Purse Brossip is on the board of uh, Ballet Northwest. And so she's going to explain a little bit of the significance. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Selby, council members for the record. My name is Kelly Purse Brossett. I'm the Strategic Communications Director for the city. Um, I've also been a member of the Ballet Northwest Board of Directors off and on. I, I escaped for a couple of years, but sort of like the Corleone family, they pulled me back in. Um, they do uh, wonderful work. Uh, they have, uh, uh, they bring thousands of uh, our residents and people from around the area to our downtown for their productions of the Nutcracker and the spring productions, uh, as well as uh, many, many local families who spend a lot of time downtown and downtown restaurants um, with bringing their kids to rehearsals. And uh, I, I have been there and I have done my time sewing point shoes. So, um, but I'm really, really um, excited about this uh, 50th anniversary and um, you guys recognizing this. Uh, I, with us today is uh, Ken Johnson, who is the co-artistic director, and Paula Lowe, who is the vice president of the board and um, the chair of the 50th anniversary committee. Wonderful, and so I'm going to read a mayoral proclamation to honor their 50th anniversary, and then I'll be handing that off to, um, to Ken. So, whereas since 1970, Ballet Northwest has served as a community-based group dedicated to promoting, teaching, and preserving the art of dance in Southwest Washington, and whereas Ballet Northwest was founded in the city of Olympia and stands as the only nonprofit ballet company in Thurston County and the oldest ballet company in the state of Washington, and whereas Ballet Northwest has a proud legacy of making the art of dance accessible to all children, regardless of their ability to pay. And whereas Ballet Northwest produces high quality dance performances featuring primarily local dancers and has touched the lives of thousands of people in Southwest Washington, including dancers, cast, crews, parents, volunteers, and audiences. And whereas Ballet Northwest will celebrate an impressive milestone 50 years of bringing ballet and the art of dance to Olympia and the greater Thurston County region, and whereas Ballet Northwest will present its 50th anniversary gala on Saturday, January 25th at the Washington Center for the Performing Arts, and the event will feature professional dancers from the American Ballet Theater, New York City Ballet, San Francisco Ballet, Boston Ballet, and the National Ballet of Cuba. And whereas the city of Olympia congratulates Ballet Northwest for 50 years of championing the art of dance in our community, and now, therefore, be it resolved, the City Olympia City Council does hereby proclaim January 25th, 2020, as Ballet Northwest Day in the City of Olympia and encourages residents to recognize the positive impact of dance and all of the arts on our community. Signed in the City of Olympia, Washington, this 21st day of January, 2020, Olympia City Council, Cheryl Selby, Mayor. So on behalf of the thousands of dancers, parents, and volunteers uh, who have worked with Ballet Northwest over these last 50 years, thank you for this proclamation and thank you for your support of the arts in Olympia. Uh, we've been so proud to call downtown Olympia home for these last five decades and look forward to our future here and working with um, such an amazing group of young people and adults. And we hope you'll join in us for the rest of our 50th anniversary season, including our gala this Saturday and the rest of our season at the Washington Center. So thank you so much. Thank you. Any comments from the day? Um, I would just like to remark that you know, it's remark remarkable uh, for any nonprofit to last 50 years, let alone a, an, an arts organization. And so it's commendable. And I know there's a, an amazing history rich with a legacy from a former 
Johnson family, right? Johansson, sorry. Um, sorry, I messed that up in my head. And so we hope to ha have another 50 beers for you downtown. So thank you so much. All right. uh, that takes us to our public communication uh, portion of this evening. Uh, it's that time of year. I don't know whether you noticed we got another uh, election a voter's guide in the mail uh, this last week. So we do have quite a few uh, local levies uh, on the ballots coming up on February 11th. And so uh, we cannot allow a speaker to promote or oppose a ballot measure in the um, chambers here for public during public comment. Um, other than that, m most of the people here, I think, are familiar with uh, how to give public comment. But you have three minutes over my right shoulder is a countdown clock. Uh, we have a unique situation in that we um, do not have any other business on our agenda tonight. So a very, very short agenda. And so what I'm going to um, propose, if it's okay with the council, we go ahead and here we have 18 people signed up and normally they wouldn't all fit in the first 30 minutes. But um, since it would be silly to stop and then take two minutes to do our um, consent calendar and then come back, we'll just go through the whole sign up sheet um, at the beginning of the of the meeting so that's all right excellent so I will call you up three at a time if you can stage yourself here and that saves people coming back and forth and back and forth um, all right we've got Esther Cronenberg followed by Jerry Durker followed by James Wellings hi uh, my name is Esther Cronenberg I'm a resident of the Green Cove watershed for the last year, I've been researching the Green Cove Park project since its first incarnation in 2004. I've reviewed all the reports submitted by the developers since 2004, all the public comments, hundreds of documents from DNR and Ecology, and hundreds of more from the city and the county that I got through public disclosure requests. I've also consulted with a well-respected licensed hydrogeologist in the county whose serious concerns about the project led him to map the extent of the waste pits on the housing plot as shown there, and an EPA trained and certified watershed manager who has expert knowledge of environmental laws governing development. I've sent the city council many emails over the last year to inform you of the many data gaps in the file record, especially the lack of testing for contaminants. This site operated for decades as an illegal, unpermitted gravel mine, log yard, and solid and hazardous waste dump with absolutely no oversight and no permits. All my public disclosure requests thus far have shown no permits for the gravel mine except from 1972 to 79, no permits as a log yard, no permits for a solid dump site, no permits for a hazardous waste dump site, and no permits for any stormwater construction. Yet all of these activities occurred regularly over 60 years. More troubling is the fact this site is a quick four-minute four drive from Bud Inlet, whose toxic legacy the port and city still deal with. I don't have time to reiterate all the sources and types of toxic chemicals dumped on this site. What confronts us now is the attorney for Mr. Mahan's latest refusal to test for these toxics, in spite of the city's legal and reasonable request that he do so. Developer Mahan is asking the city to take on the liability of a contaminated site, a problem the city compounded in November by buying an adjoining parcel as a park amenity for this project before it's even approved. He's asking the city to rely on reports, many done by unlicensed individuals and funded by him, which specifically do not guarantee the safety of the site, and all of which, mindful of their own liability, recommend additional testing he now claims is not needed. Tests done penetrated 13 feet below ground, but the mine depth was 35 feet, and the last tests done in 2008 were done years before hundreds more truckloads of untested fill was dumped. The proposal to build houses for 181 families on 20-foot pilings on untested fill is reckless and unconscionable. Are you willing to assume this liability for the city? He's also asking the city to ignore federal laws governing this site. Those are federal, there's a direct connection between this site and Bud Inlet, and that means that it's a violation of federal law, Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, and all the federal uh, agencies that have been that are supposed to be involved in this review have not even been contacted. 
Are you willing to risk Mr. Mahan's Thank you. jeopardized Thank you so federal funding Up next, for that? Jerry Durker, followed by James Welling. I'd be happy to discuss with you more. And because yes. three minutes is yes, scarcely I sufficient. So just for our audience, if you cannot get through all of your comments in the first three minutes, you can submit written comments to Kelly over here, or you can email them to us. Thank you. Jerry Durker, followed by James Wellings, followed by Ellen Dorfman. Hi, my name is Jerry Durker. I, I live at 2826 Cooper Point Road, Northwest, Olympia, Washington, 98502. Uh, I want to show you, uh, as I've brought this uh, picture here before to you guys, uh, if you notice on there, you will see piles of stuff on the 2015 picture there. None of those piles were tested. There wasn't, a, as Esther just got through uh, letting you know, there has been no actual testing chemical or geotechnical testing done on the site other than a uh, wetlands report since 2008. All that material you see in the 2015 that's different from the, uh, the other ones, that's all been brought in and none of that's been tested at all. There's at least uh, 10 feet, probably more like 15 feet and some places more than that uh, of, w of waste that Mr. Mahan and company brought in from various different uh, places around. Much of that's piled there. None of it got te none of it got tested. Uh, the the test pits that they did do were only 13 feet down, and if they're putting 20 foot pin pilings in because they know how unstable the ground is underneath the site, they obviously need to do more geotechnical. Uh, all their all of their geotechnical reports say they need to have a more thorough, less limited, less restricted, and more detailed chemical and, and geotechnical testing. Uh, I've got quite an expertise in geotechnical uh, stuff and stormwaters and things. And uh, the, the, the city's former hearing examiner, uh, Tom B. Organ, recognized that I'm uh, an expert in those kinds of fields. I actually helped rewrite the state stormwater manual in 1993, among other things. <laughs> so these are very serious problems here. Uh, there was a recently, uh, two days or so after uh, the letter from uh, the, the port's attorney, uh, pardon me, Mr. Mahan's attorney, it's the same person, uh, uh, took and uh, put this letter in saying that they're not, they don't believe they could have to do any new, uh, more testing of, despite what the city says. Uh, two days later, there was a co uh, collapse out there of a, a storm, a legal stormwater pond, and it, and it showed illegal stormwater pipes dumping stormwater down in the, in the, onto the site. This is a very serious problem here, and there was a, a sinkhole there uh, that collapsed. So they know that it's an unstable site. Groundwater comes all the way up to the surface through all of those things. So this is a, this is one of those uh, things that if the water can come up, the water can go down. And the water is going down into your aquifer because there's at least 35 feet of stuff that Mr. Sunberg put in and another 10 to 15 that Mr. Mahan put in. So that's 50 feet down that you would have had to go at least to do a real test on the site. Thank you very much. Thank you. James Wellings, followed by Ellen Dorfman, followed by Danae. Hi. <coughs> Hi, thank you for this opportunity. I'll be brief. When I first got up in front of the city council several years ago, 10 years ago, Karen Rogers was on the city council. I don't remember how long ago it was. The very first thing I talked about was emotional sobriety. And what we've got going on here is ever since then, you know what's happened with the homeless issue and whatnot and some other things. So I'm bringing it up again a good 10 years later. I was homeless for a while. I did it by choice because I didn't have the coping skills, the critical thinking skills, and the communication skills. So I went and lived in a van. I didn't know how to have roommates without getting upset. And one could hardly blame me. I lacked imagination, right? Well, now there's been an almost complete turnaround in my mindset. I even have a college degree in 
anger management. It's actually called peer support counseling. I want us to explore that. For example, when I meet somebody who foolishly went and got on some weird drug that I never did, instead of saying, why in the world did you do that when you know how addictive it is? Instead, I say, okay, you went and did this thing. How do we solve the problem? What do you want to do? And I've met people who have gotten off that stuff, and it wasn't easy for them, I'll tell you what, but they went and they did it. And, uh, you know, my whole deal is I was born a happy, logical thinker, and by the time I was 22, I was a complete and total wreck. Just, that's where emotional sobriety comes in. A lot of us, uh, you know, this, this is the kind of thing that can benefit all of us, no matter how well-adjusted we are or how well-adjusted we think we are. We really got to look at this over and over again, no matter what. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you. Ellen Dorfman, followed by, I think it's Danae or Danaea. Uh, I'm not asking the city to put this as a vote yet. It's just some background information. The state is trying to pass HB 2344, which is the Humane Pet Sales Bill Act, and about 386 municipalities in the U.S. have passed similar things. California, Maryland, and I think Maine now have passed a statewide ban um, because there is uh, over more than 120 stores across Washington, large and small, that um, have pet-friendly stores. In other words, they do pet adoptions. Petco has monthly, bi-monthly, PetSmart very often. Pet Works almost every Saturday. Mud Bay has almost weekly adoption events. So um, if you have a puppy mill store, first of all, we don't need more stores. We have you know, tractor supply, kits are, we have plenty of stores and that will put a jeopardy on the stores selling pet supplies here. And second of all, um, if you have them selling more puppies that they're bringing in than the dogs that the rescues are taking in, it will just be more animals and so joint animal services will just end up being more inundated. That's not even addressing the humanity or the inhumanity part. The state bill that is, could, I don't know how, what the word's called, it's HB 234, um, what we're, we would ask the city eventually, and we're not doing it tonight, um, the same thing as the state, would not infringe on responsible or reputable breeders of dogs and cats to sell directly to the public, nor would it prevent responsible animal rescue organizations partnering with pet stores. Um, it's that um, it's pretty well known, but if you don't know, research shows that animals born and raised in puppy mills, kitten factories, and rabbit mills are much more likely to have genetic disorders and lack adequate socialization. The ASPCA asserts that animals used for breeding at these facilities are subject to inhumane housing conditions, almost exclusively indiscriminately disposed of when they reach the end of their life. In other words, they kill them or whatever. Um, they don't hardly see the vets. They'll call them USDA certified. The USDA doesn't really go in and do anything. I mean, it's really pathetic. Um, the Humane Society has a guard to using local organiz um, ordinances to combat puppy mills, estimates that there's one to two million puppies are produced yearly um, in these facilities. There's five to 10,000 puppy mills in the U.S. Um, and the conditions are usually horrendous. They have in inadequate housing, shelter, staffing, nutrition, socialization, sanitation, exercise, veterinary care, and inappropriate breeding. Um, and we have lots of stores here who have adoption events and they're very successful. So you don't, you don't need to have horrendously bred animals. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Danae, Danaea? Danae. Danae. Yeah. Followed by Michelle Andrews, followed by Terry Close. Close. Um, thank you for uh, letting me speak. And before I get into what I want to address, I just want to second that um, puppy mills are disgusting. They're disturbing. Um, any retailer that would cater to puppy mills has no business, no place in this town or in this state. And if you're not familiar with puppy mills, I highly recommend you go on YouTube and, and give yourself a crash course. It has no business here. Um, but the reason I'm here tonight is because I want to talk about money. Uh, our homeless response coordinator is being paid a six-figure salary. 
In fact, a local church has pledged a donation of $100,000 a year for three years to support his position. Now, if you get an eviction notice and you go to the church for help, the church will talk to you and they'll give you a pledge of $100. And then they'll give you a pamphlet with all the other charities. And you have to go to each of those charities and try to round up the remainder of the balance of however much you need to pay your rent. If you can't get that money, it's tough. The, the church will not honor their pledge and you're basically out on your ass. But Mr. DeForest will be there for you because now you're homeless. Like, is anyone catching the disconnect here? All right. Um, his aide, that job was posted with an offer of $50,000 a year. The downtown ambassadors, that was budgeted for $466,000. The clean team, that's over $200,000. Every one of the porta potties that you see downtown and in surrounding areas costs roughly $14,000 per unit to maintain and to clean and rent. That's over a million dollars per year just to keep things the way that they are now and it's got to stop. The average cost to lock up a sex offender, a drug dealer, a vandal, they run about $35,000 a year per offender. Now, I'm not a math whiz, but I can guarantee you it's far more affordable and far more functional to put 30 or so of the most dangerous, chronically homeless people in jail every year than it is to continue down the path that we're currently on. And we've been told that we can't arrest our way out of this. Okay, we've been told that we just need more. More of our tax money is going to pay for more housing, more porta potties, more people to pick up the feces and the needles and the garbage and pay for more people who ignore our phone calls and take five months to respond to a simple email. Uh, that was an email request, by the way, which was sent to none other than our homeless coordinator. The amount of good money that's being thrown at this absolute dumpster fire of a crisis is disgusting. And it is almost as disgusting as the apathy on the part of those who are tasked to resolve it. And I just think to myself, what a difference all that money could make if we fixed the problem instead of perpetuating it. But then again, there's no money in the cure, is there? Thank you. Michelle Andrews, followed by Terry, I can't speak. Read the last name, please. Klaus? Okay. All right. Um, so good evening. Thank you for having us today. Uh, my name is Michelle Andrews. I, I live out uh, 7539 58th Avenue Northeast Olympia. And I emailed you all my concerns about the puppy mill store opening up um, West Olympia. And I'm here to support, or here to express my support of a humane pet store ordinance. So we need this ordinance to stop the supply of puppy mills to, puppy mill dogs to the pet stores. Some of these pet stores uh, may claim that they're licensed by the USDA. That only means that they allow the cage to be six inches bigger than the dog itself. So. There's a lot of deception going on there. Um, and uh, the dog is kept in the cage all the time um, and bred its entire life. So until it can't be bred anymore and then it's either sold or auctioned. Um, auctioning of dogs is very popular in the Midwest. Um, so it's yeah, very dismal life. And uh, this is basically factory farming of pets. It's cruel, it's inhumane business, um, where the animal's health and well-being is not the priority. It's all about money. So, and I volunteer at the animal shelter uh, here in Thurston County. I've been doing it for years. And although I'd love to promote people to adopt from the shelter first and foremost, I, I recognize that there's a lot of people that prefer to go through a breeder, and I respect that. Um, so there's a lot of responsible breeders out there. So there's no place uh, puppy mill puppies here in Thurston County. Um, so uh, these reputable breeders, they do not supply their puppies to pet stores. They want to know the people that they're giving these, that they're selling their puppies to. Um, contrastingly, puppy, puppy land uh, specifically uses very large scale puppy mill broker um, out in the Midwest. Uh, and this broker receives puppies from 
puppy mills, including one that is, has 774 breeding dogs on site. That in, does not include the puppies. So please support this, um, please support a humane pet store ordinance as soon as possible. This store is um, set to open next month. So um, by allowing the sale of puppies from this, this store, City of Olympia will be part of the problem. As, as someone who grew up here in Olympia, West Olympia, I went to Garfield Elementary, the original school, um, and also as a, a volunteer at the shelter, I, I strongly encourage you to, to, to support this pet ordinance. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Terry Klaus, followed by Cynthia Hahn, followed by Sarah Joseph. Hello, my comments will be short. I'm Terry Klaus, I live in Olympia, and um, I'm here to support my, uh, an ordinance, an, a humane ordinance um, for, uh, the, for the uh, pups that are, <clears throat> I'm not doing a very good job of this. Anyway, um, the, um, it is really frightening to think of, of Olympia supporting a pet store that is going to sell these dogs to uh, exorbitant prices, you know, $3,000 for dogs, and, uh, how are, and financing them. And um, anyway, I just want to support an ordinance that will prohibit this. And I know Kitsap County had adopted an ordinance, but there are some unscrupulous breeders out there, or uh, brokers, I should say, that will form a rescue, and they're in fact circumventing uh, and trying to avoid being scrutinized. So I sent you all an email and a, a model ordinance from the Humane Society of the United States. So I implore you to look at that, and thank you. Thank you. Cynthia Hahn, followed by Sarah Joseph, followed by Chris Van Dalen. Thank you for your time. My name is Cynthia Hahn. I also had sent an email on to most of you, I believe, and I just want to express my concerns also on the puppy mill, going in puppy land, puppy store that gets their... Um, are known for bringing their dogs into the puppy mill, and you've already heard a lot of that. I just uh, want to just um, say again that they are very um, conniving at how they go around. They found lots of loopholes to um, bring their puppies in here, and we don't we don't need that. We have so many great rescues, and we have our animal shelter that do an amazing job with um, the pet stores we already have that sponsor adopt adoption events for helping our animals here already. Um, I don't want to take a lot of your time already reiterating what's been told, so thank you. Thank you. Sarah Joseph, followed by Chris Van Dalen, followed by Mary Morris. Good evening, everybody. Um, 2020 needs to be a year of action. Um, for a city of the size, we have too many people living in squalor and camps around the city, and we can and should be doing better for those human beings within our city. Sheltering in place has proven to be unsafe, inhumane, and a failure, and it's not compassion. It's just tense, and it's just squalor. I don't think there's anyone on this council who would allow an elderly person suffering from dementia to fend for themselves in camps without intervention, but somehow um, we allow those with um, mental illness and addiction to live that way. Moving forward for 2020, we need to have accountability paired with compassion. I understand our current challenges with the lack of low-income housing, mental health beds, and beds for drug rehabilitations, but just because these challenges exist does not mean that we can't rise to those and do better while working on larger issues that will take years. We absolutely can, and other cities are doing it. We need to make regular outreach into these camps a priority. Police, fire, and most importantly, social and mental health workers need to be regularly visiting and engaging with these camps to ensure their safety, along with the safety of the community at large. This will put a damper on any potential predatory behaviors while providing options to those who want to make a better choice. 
We must know who are, in, who are in these camps and what their needs are and so that we can get them out of these camps and into safer and better situations. This is not a tactic, it's a right thing to do. Those advocates who choose to sponsor unsanctioned camps need to follow the city's lead and not dictate the terms to the city and to the taxpaying citizens who live here and are paying for this. There needs to be clear expectations for these camps and clear consequences when they are not met. Furthermore, it needs to be clear that, when the, that these camps are a temporary measure, not a life trial choice that's going to be condoned indefinitely by our community. It's not sustainable and more importantly, it's not humane. I'm glad that the 4th Avenue Bridge encampment is finally being cleared. It's a good start. I suggest that after a full abatement of that site has been completed, deterrents are placed there to discourage others from coming back there and damaging the infrastructure again. It would be nice for our residents and visitors of Olympia to take that beautiful walk down there without being menaced. We need to address the Moxley Creek, Percival Creek, Wheeler, and Jungle encampments that are located in sensitive watersheds. No more half measures. In future years, I would like to see our tax money being used for shelters, both low barrier and sober living shelters, transitional housing, assistance with rent and deposits, but not endlessly cleaning squalor and abating environment, environmental damage that should never have been condoned to begin with. Thank you. Thank you. Got Chris Van Dahlen, followed by Mary Morris, followed by Chris Stearns. Good evening, <clears throat> excuse me. Good evening, Mayor Selby and members of the council. I'm Chris Van Dallen, and I usually come before I did speak about buildings and energy and green building. Um, but today I have something more important uh, to, to discuss and how could that possibly be for me, right? Um, it's our young people. Now, I think most of us are parents or have other young people who are really special to us and dear, really important in our lives. Um, on July 23rd last year, this council adopted uh, the Youth Climate Inherent Inheritance Act uh, Ordinance M2045, which declared that the city would commit to protect the youth of this community from risks of climate destruction. And you committed to a, uh, a vision and a sense of urgency to become a climate neutral community. And I just wanna say thank you, that's a huge commitment and I wanna be a resource and help you uh, to follow through on that commitment any way that I can. Um, and I know the youth of this community will also help as much as they can. Um, the ordinance also refers to the Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan, uh, which was uh, commissioned in part by this council, and it's now being developed. I serve on the Climate Action Work Group in the Buildings and Energy Group, and, um, and I see both promise and peril in this plan that's being developed. But promise definitely because there's strong support in the form of carbon reduction targets, uh, city funding to make this plan happen, um, and uh, participation from members of the council and staff into the process. I also see peril because despite this commitment to protect our youth from climate destruction, I don't see the city council or the staff developing new policies, examining each decision through the lens of the climate emergency or declaring a climate emergency, which I hope that you will do very soon. Um, it's definitely really obvious that that is the case and uh, we need to do that, make that official. Um, <clears throat> now today uh, in Davos, Switzerland, the Swedish teen activist uh, Greta Thunberg uh, spoke and she again issued a very stark warning to the world leaders um, calling for unprecedented action um, and also dismay, expressed dismay at the lack of action despite 40 years of scientific evidence and reassuring words. Um, you know, she's basically saying that you say, quote, uh, you say to us children, just leave this to us, we'll fix it, we, don't, we won't let you down. And then silence or something worse than silence, empty words and promises that give the impression that sufficient action is being taken. That's the peril of the Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan is that it's a lot of great words, but empty promises that aren't actually gonna get acted on. So um, we have to recognize that our house is still on fire and that we have to act as if our children, as if we love our children more than anything else. Uh, Friday is the youth climate strike again, and I'll be spending the day with the youth climate lobby uh, meeting with legislatures up on the Capitol Hill. I would like to invite you all to join in that and uh, do ever in, in, join any of the other youth climate strikes and um, let me help you any way I can, Thank thanks. Thank you. I've got Mary Morris, followed by Chris Stearns, followed by Ashley, can't read the last name. Good evening, uh, Mayor Selby, council members. 
Um, my name is Mary Morris, and I'm here tonight because this afternoon I read a Facebook post that one of these people probably posted regarding this development. And it was the first I'd heard of the development and the concern for whether the council would deny the permit uh, unless the toxic testing, toxins testing would be done. Uh, I lived for many years in Tacoma, and um, they had a similar problem. They found federal funds to remediate the problem. They have a beautiful Point Ruston uh, in existence now, a lovely place to go. Um, if this is also the first I'd heard that the city had purchased land to, to develop a park um, around this development or for this development. It doesn't mean that the city's lost out on funding uh, if the remediation happens. And I just encourage you to consider the long-term effects and the liability that the city, that it might imply for the city if the permit is not denied pending toxic test, toxins testing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask, I know um, I was a little lenient, but I do request that people don't clap or boo for anybody that's speaking because it needs to be a space for people's, all of, for all of people's views. And so I'm just going to ask that you refrain from clapping or booing um, for speakers. Thank you. Chris Stearns. Hi, my name is Chris Stearns. I'm Thurston PED Commissioner. I'm not representing that entity, nor just the views of my board, but just uh, my own opinions from where I live, which is out on Cooper Point. I want to welcome the new city councilor. Nice to see new people here. And uh, welcome what you all do and how hard you all work for your jurisdiction. Um, my concern is over the Green Cove development. Uh, I been a member of the Cooper Point Association for many years and we have had concerns about this development over the 181 um, units and that's been shared by former Senator Karen Frazier who also lives on Cooper Point and showed up at the planning meeting saying the things that I'm about to tell you concerns about traffic. Um, there are only two outlets at currently planned on Elliott and uh, Cooper Point Road, Elliott eventually through a neighborhood. And we're concerned that you've been warned in the past, many of you weren't here, that Elliott needs sad sidewalks. The residents there don't feel safe with joy riders from Capitol High School doing their lunch break by doing the circuit, the circle around the block, so to speak. and. As more traffic enters this artery, there are gonna be more conflicts with pedestrians. And we passed a, or the city of Olympia passed a bill to uh, pay for sidewalks and then used it for other purposes. That makes you guys liable, you know? So you need to get sidewalks out there. Uh, and the developer should pay for some of the, in, the, the, the direct effects of this development. Uh, we're concerned about stormwater runoff as a problem in this area because uh, it hasn't been adequately addressed in the past. They didn't even seem to map the rest of the county uh, adjacent to it. Um, your staff was clueless because it's on the edge of the urban growth management boundary or the city, of the corner of the city. And um, density in, into these arterials, you know, increased traffic for all the residents of Cooper Point. And that's why the Cooper Point Association is concerned about this. I'd like to also tell you that Tom's memorial, Tom Nogler passed away earlier this month from a heart attack. Uh, his memorial will be held at the Olympia Film Society this <clears throat> February the 1st, which is a Saturday from 1030 to 2 p.m. And uh, all people are welcome to attend. And also Dennis Kucinich will be in town from February 2nd to 6th former presidential candidate, and we'll see what he's up to, the former mayor of Cleveland, if you didn't know that. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Ashley, can't read the last name, followed by Madeline Schwartz, followed by Devin River. Hi, my name is Ashley Dale, and I'm representing Bailing Out Benji. Um, we're a nonprofit that educates about puppy mills and their connection to pet stores. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about the 
um, opening up a puppy world and a possible citywide pet store ordinance. Our organization obtained CVIs, which are certi certificates of veterinary inspection, which showed Puppy World's sister store in Puyallup, Washington, is getting all of their puppies from a very large USDA broker called Jack's Puppies, Inc. Um, we can only assume that Puppy World is going to be using the same supplier. Jax is currently supplying seven different states with puppy mill puppies, and they're currently being sued in Iowa and California um, for creating fake rescues and committing charity fraud. Oops. Along with sourcing animals from inhumane puppy mills, Puppyland offers financing for all of their puppies. Um, this predatory lending will target many of the college students in this area, as well as citizens who may not be able to afford the care of a puppy. In the end, they'll actually end up paying even more due to the high interest rates, which have ranged anywhere from 75 to 130 percent. Um, I have a packet which goes more in detail about the puppy mill industry, the lack of regulations to protect the animals, and the lack of enforcement of these lax regulations. Olympia has many humane pet stores that are successful without selling puppies, as well as many reputable rescues and shelters. And I just hope that you can get ahead of this problem before it becomes a much bigger issue like we're currently experiencing in Puyallup. Thank you. Thank you. Madeline Schwartz, followed by Devin River, followed by Adam St. John. Thank you for hearing me. My name is Madeline Schwartz. I live at 3530 French Road, northwest, the west side of Olympia. My property is bordered on two sides by Butler Creek on the north side and across the street on the east side. Um, my community, the Windolf community, has been working hand in hand with fisheries, with the Department of Health, and with the tribes and various and assorted other agencies to clean up Butler Cove so that the fish can come back. We've been stripping ivy out of there. We've been taking out the dams that were put in by the Schmidt family. And we've been rewarded by fish coming back. Um, in addition to that, I am the president of the Windolf Homeowners Association. And my neighbors and I went through 10 years of jumping through hoops with the state, with the county, and with the city in order to get clean water from, to our neighborhood because we had a failing well. As private citizens, we had to spend thousands of dollars to do environmental impact statements, get reviews, hire specialists to determine sites to put a well, to work with the tribes, the fisheries, Department of Health, Ecology, Thurston County Health Department, et cetera. And this was all on our dime. For Mr. Mahan to be allowed to disrespect a process that has been in place for years that private citizens have to submit to is a travesty. And it's a slap in the face to any of the people who live in my neighborhood or in any of the surrounding neighborhoods to the Green Cove project, as well as to the citizens of the greater Olympia and Thurston County communities. I heard testimony tonight about the City Council's commitment to addressing climate change and its effect on future generations. I have to wonder at the seeming disparity between this commitment and the potentially allowing the Green Cove project to move forward. If that project goes forward, you will be allowing families to move into an area that have where they have children playing on top of a toxic site. And those children will have children. And those children will have children. And this city council will be responsible for any ongoing health effects, not just to those children, but to the sound and to the, those who live in the sound. Thank you. Thank you. Devin River, followed by Adam St. John. Hi, I'm here um, against the Green Cove development as well. Um, now there's a lot of people here, I think, who are here against it. And um, uh, there's a lot of folks here who haven't even heard about this issue before tonight. And that's rather disturbing to me, considering this is such a special and important piece of land. 
Um, this is a critical aquifer recharge zone. I know that phrase has been repeated a lot over the course of this dialogue, but people need to hear that as well. It's a critical piece of land. Um, this is uh, actually connected with the city's own municipal water supply. I've got a uh, P I got a document here that was submitted. The city received uh, December 23rd, 2014 from Robinson Noble. It's a groundwater environmental scientist. I guess they did a, um, uh, they tested some parts of the site. Um, they said, uh, the region's hydrology is described in the city of Olympia's Allison Springs and East Olympia Allison Springs Wellhead Protection Plan. Uh, the area is underlain by an alternating sequence of glacial and non-glacial sediments, forming several confined aquifer systems. The extended capture zone of the Allison Springs wellhead extends beneath the subject property. The wells in this well field are completed in several aquifer systems that produce water for the city of Olympia's municipal supply. So not only would the toxins of building on this land affect stormwater, affect neighborhood streams, salmon and orca habitat, but it could even affect our own drinking water. This is a, uh, a critical piece of land. It deserves remediation, not, um, it, it, need, it needs to be remediated of these toxins and preserved um, as a park in line with any climate action policy. We have to preserve our water. That is so important. I mean, it's the city's own tagline, you know, uh, it's, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I feel like I'm kind of running out of my comment here. I actually came here uh, somewhat unprepared, but just knowing that this is, this is so important. I had to show up. Um, I hope that you take these comments to heart. Thank you. Thank you. Adam St. John and our last speaker tonight is Barbara, it looks like Bucken. Hello. I'm also here uh, against the Green Cove development. And um, so just to say a little bit about, it is a critical aquifer recharge area. Um, some maps label it as extreme in terms of, it's like a gradient and uh, that part of the map is labeled as extreme. It's actually the, so it's a, I wish I had the map with me, but it's the, the area labeled extreme is actually square and it's because they've, mind that area that whole piece of land so i mean because it used to be a hill right and they've mined it down and it's a square on the map that is labeled as an extreme critical aquifer recharge area um it's kind of the i don't i wouldn't say it's the highest point in west olympia i think that might be like where the water tower is or something but it's it seems like it's the highest point in that whole area the water flows down um and uh, Green Cove Creek and Green Cove Basin uh, f uh, extends out through the Cooper Point Peninsula. And so we're definitely looking at that the water flows from that point down into the wells of um, everyone downstream from there. And as Devin just said, it also connects to the city's water supply. Um, something, uh, a question that comes up, I feel like, is this question of like, okay, well, we know it we know that the cascade pole company and other forms of pollution were dumped there like i don't think that that's up for much debate that's like a historical fact um and uh there's this question of well has that been cleaned up or not they tested the soil didn't find anything in the soil or some something i'm not sure exactly how it worked out the thing is that the cat the poles are still there and there's a like there's people who have photographs of it. There's a bunch of people who have photographs of it. They don't want to bring that evidence and show it to you and show it to Mayhan. Like nobody wants to be involved in this. Like so you're putting these citizens, someone like me, like I'm just like a young person, like don't want to have to do with any of this stuff, getting in the way of someone who's like making millions of dollars on this thing, when you can go there and there's piles of creosoted poles. Like, you, like, I mean, you could go and saw off a chunk and bring it in here. Like, it's, they're there. It's their oozing black coal tar creosote and on the surface of the soil. So it's, it's very strange to me that there, this testing would be done. And while it, these, the things are still on the surface of the soil in plain sight. So it brings up this question of, you know, is Mahan aware of this? Or like, has, is someone lying? Because for this to 
it, it, it's in plain sight, like, and why isn't this being rejected if he's repeatedly refused, like, but it's, it's right there. Like, I don't, I just, yeah. I mean, if it goes to the hearing examiner, like, Thank you. There is evidence of, I don't know. Thank you. Barbara Bucken? I didn't really come prepared to speak. I think these people on the issue of Green Cove have said it so much better than I could. But I, I have moved here recently from a large metropolitan area. And it strikes me that it's a very good thing to be able to address your representatives very directly in this kind of a forum. I just hope you will listen to these comments and step up and do the right thing. Thank you. That concludes public comment for this evening. Uh, and before, um, I would like to have someone um, explain to this gentleman about public comment sign-up sheets so that they get collected right before we go on camera. Thank you. There's, um, no, I've closed co public comment. So um, you're uh, available to write comments. And our city manager will explain it to you. Um, all right, I lost my train of thought. So we are going to um, have our, I think, uh, Leonard Bauer is going to come up and talk to us about the Green Cove development uh, process and where we are in that. And then regarding the Puppy Land, um, per, um, their their permit to open a business here. Uh, I'm going to have uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bateman uh, relay a message from Councilmember Parchley, who is a veterinarian, and you know let you know kind of managing expectations about what we can and can't do with the current uh, business, but uh, definitely uh, being proactive going forward. So, but Leonard okay. Green Cove. Thank you, uh, Mayor and members of the Council. Uh, Leonard Bauer, I'm the Interim Director of Community Planning Development. Just to provide an update on the review of the Green Cove subdivision application, which has been mentioned this evening quite often. Um, first of all, no decision has been made on that. The review is still underway. It has been for some time as we have um, received a, a lot of information and comments. We appreciate that from our, our public and in, in sharing the information that they have about the project. Um, the current status is that the staff has provided extensive comments to the applicant. We have extended the review time on this project because of the extensive amount of information that's been gathered and, and is still being reviewed. Also, the State Environmental Policy Act review process is still underway as well based on the information that we're gathering. Uh, at this time, the comments are with the applicant. We're awaiting responses to the last round of comments and the information that we've requested. So that's the status at this point. Uh, for the public, the, uh, I do want to clarify, state agencies have been provided notice of this project. We have been consulting with state agencies and uh, tribal e e entities on this. And the final process in, is a public hearing in front of the city's hearing examiner, as well as a final decision from the examiner after that hearing, uh, based on the evidence, based on the applicable requirements, both local, state, and federal, if, if uh, if, if any of, of those laws apply, as they apply, the hearing examiner will make a decision based on those. So there is a project webpage. Uh, for those of you who go to the city uh, website, just put Green Cove in the search bar and um, you'll find all the information that we've received so far on this and uh, follow the status there. All right, thank you. Any questions from the dais? Okay, I've got Councilmember Rollins, Rollins followed by Councilmember Gilman. I just was hoping you could clarify um, the process because um, as I, I know, but isn't widely um, isn't wide knowledge that these matters don't actually get approved by the city council, and that's why it goes to a hearings examiner. Can you talk about that and just how that process comes about? Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, many cities play a hearing examiner to, to uh, make decisions on land use applications such as subdivisions. Uh, so Olympia is one. And a hearing examiner is a is a trained land use attorney and uh, makes the decisions based on again the evidence provided. The hearing uh, that has that will be held by our examiner can uh, be an opportunity for additional evidence, and then based on the applicable rules and regulations, it allows uh, that to be a fact fact based decision, and um, that is uh, why we we hire a, a examiner to to uh, review those kinds of processes. Okay, um, Councilmember Gilman, followed by Councilmember Madrone. Thank you. So, just to 
to sort of further, I, I think, mm -hmm. what I heard in Renato's question, at, at what point or what sort of situations would council have a decision to make? So, uh, as council knows, but uh, for the benefit of the public, the council's uh, decision making is around what's called legislative decisions, so policy, setting policies, setting budget, uh, with related to land use decisions, examples are the adoption of a comprehensive plan or a change to our zoning or the regulations that apply. Uh, the hearing examiner then reviews specific applications for how they meet those uh, regulations and, and policies that have been adopted by the council. So that this is a specific application of those regulations and, and policies the council has set. Thank you, Leonard. <laughs> All right, Council Member Madrone. Um, I'm curious if there's any uh, timeline that we can anticipate where if the developer has to respond to the comments that they've received mm -hmm. uh, within a certain amount of time. There, there is. Um, so uh, just to uh, provide a little framework, the state generally requires 120-day review time by a city of an application that's been submitted by a property owner. There is opportunity to extend that, which, as I mentioned earlier, we have done. Um, this round of, app of um, comments that we provided back to the applicant, the applicant has until I believe the deadline was February 8th. That should be on the website. Uh, I may be off by a day or two there, but it's coming up in, in a few weeks, and that'll be the, the timeline for the applicant to submit a response to our comments. All right, Councilmember Cooper. Thank you, Mayor Selby. And so the comments <clears throat> that are being responded to, do they do they mandate chemical testing of the soil and groundwater to see if there's any story here based on what we're hearing from the public? So the, the comments did uh, request some additional information based on testing of, of the property, yes, and some additional testing as well. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thank you for, for uh, staying true to that uh, as mm -hmm. we move forward, and I look forward to hearing yeah. how it goes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And Mayor Pro Tem Bateman. Thank you. I'd like to thank the members of our community that came forward tonight to talk about a humane pet store ordinance. I did reply to some of you via email. And I also wanted to relay a message from our colleague, Council Member Parshley, who is a veterinarian and is our representative for Joint Animal Services. So I will read her statement now. I have seen firsthand the impact of puppy mill conditions. These conditions not only impact the puppies, but the parent dogs who live in squalor, producing several litters a year. It is truly heartbreaking to witness these conditions and the animals who live in it. In short, and politely stated, puppy and kitten mills animals are not only inhumanely treated, they have a high risk, sometimes of fatal infectious diseases. Often they suffer lifelong with genetic disorders such as orthopedic abnormalities that can make walking and running an excruciating experience. Puppy and kitten mills use breeding programs that would be considered illegal and highly immoral for any human civilization. So why do these animal mills exist? It is all economic, not out of love for animals. Animal mill economics is directly linked to there being a market to sell these animals. It is a market that in large part includes less than scrupulous or unsuspecting pet stores and sometimes worse and shadier outlets such as trying to use them for fighting rings or to develop new animal mills. Here's the crux of the issue. We do not need puppy or kitten mills to produce a supply of pets for our community. Every year, 6.5 million cats and dogs enter the US animal shelters, roughly half our dogs. Only around 700,000 of these animals will find their way back to a home. More sadly, 1.5 million of these animals will be euthanized, which equates to 150 to 300 animals being put to sleep during tonight's council meeting. Prodigious work has been done to reduce these numbers and statistics. These reductions are largely due to the efforts of humane societies and rescue groups around the country. It is also through legislative policies, reducing the market for these puppy and kitten mills animals, such as ordinances making it illegal to sell animal mill puppies or kittens in pet shops. These ordinances do not outlaw adoption of puppies or kittens through pet shops, or responsible animal breeders. Rather, they redirect where the animals offered and originate from, enforcing a shift towards animals coming from nonprofit rescues, animal service shelters, humane societies, or responsible pet breeders. I'm announcing tonight that I am going to be bringing at our next council meeting on February 4th a referral written in coordination with Mayor Pro Tem Jessica Bateman and Councilmember Renata Rollins that will be referred to the General Government Committee 
to work in a timely manner to develop and bring back to council an ordinance prohibiting the sale of puppy and kitten mill animals from pet shops in Olympia. Thank you for listening to my strong support for these initiatives. Council member Lisa Parshley. Thank you. Thank you for, for reporting out on that. Um, I'm just sad that we didn't have this on our radar in time to prevent what's probably going to happen, but we'll need your continued advocacy. All right, Councilmember Cooper. Thank you, Mayor Selby. <clears throat> Pardon me. Just a couple additional comments. Uh, one, I'm 100% supportive of a humane um, puppy ordinance. Thank you for organizing and showing that Olympia is humane. Um, in fact, I'd also ask that maybe um, either in conjunction with or after general government has its conversation that council member partially uh, take that to the Joint Animal Services Board and ask them to make a recommendation that the three the cities and the county. Uh, it looks like Kitsap County, as I was looking, has done that for pretty much the core urban area, uh, all of the cities and the county. And so it'd be great to have some sort of model uh, ordinance there that, that goes around. So don't forget our neighbors, please, because uh, we're tight. And, uh, you know, if, if one should uh, lose its ability to do business in the model they thought, uh, they'll be looking for cheap rent close by. So. Um, the next thing is that uh, Chris Van Dalen, I agree with you 100%. Uh, we have some significant culture change uh, coming at us in order to achieve our climate goals and action is the only answer. Um, to that end, I've st I'm stepping in to take uh, Council Member Jones's uh, position on the planning committee. Uh, my one goal, other than continuing the good work that's happened there, is to make that committee uh, remain as a monitoring and hold each other accountable body uh, for the region so that it's not left to each jurisdiction to implement their own uh, wishes within the plan. Uh, and then lastly, uh, for Commissioner Stearns, I just have to correct you on one simple thing, and, and we know each other, so I know I can do this in public uh, for, for the benefit of the community. Um, I have zero question that all of our sidewalk money has been spent, spent on sidewalks, and I've been the chair of the Finance Committee now for multiple years in a row. Um, I will admit that we did um, reappropriate some of the parks money from that 2004 parks and sidewalk measure into keeping our park system open and maintained during the recession as was allowed by the ordinance and the vote by the people. So if you could just uh, help us correct that fallacy in the community, it would be really helpful. Uh, and again, thanks to all the Green Cove uh, folks for being concerned about the environment and your neighborhood, and we'll get to the bottom of this. Thank you, thank you. And I should, I, I, can I just say that, okay. that that question alone resulted in us having the best funded park system in America with a, a passage of the Metropolitan Parks District, so. All right, and Councilmember Rollins. Thank you. I just want to thank everyone for coming out. I hope that the um, that everyone who's concerned with Green Cove will continue to monitor the process. And just to underscore that um, that that is go that does go through a hearings examiner and not our council. Um, regarding the the puppy mill ordinance, um, we'll be ex uh, taking a look at that referral February 4th as council, excuse me, as Mayor Pro Tem Bateman said. Um, and I, I just really believe in, um, in cities and counties taking the lead on things like this that are a culture change so that we can push change at the state level and maybe even further. Um, that's really important to me and it's really, when it comes down to it, it's just about how we treat people that happen to be animals. So thank you for coming out. Um, Chris Van Dalen, um, I, I do support declaring a climate emergency and I hope the governor does that as well. Um, and I think we have a meeting scheduled to talk about that. So, um, or look for your email if, if you haven't seen it. Um, and then lastly, I just wanna lift up something that James Welling said early in the, um, in the process of public comment about the, the success of peer programs. Um, and I wanna highlight that because I come from that background and it really, they are really amazing programs, both for mental health and substance use. Um, the situation we're in regarding um, homelessness and um, substance use issues is there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle and I'm just gonna introduce another piece because it's really complex. So the Olympia Bupe Clinic, it's a um, successful opioid treatment center. It runs on a peer model, which means that the people that work there have lived experience with um, addiction with opioids or, or family ex member experience. Um, they're getting nationally recognized for their success. They have money to build in, to, to move into a larger space. The problem is no property owner will rent to them because of stigma. 
for who they serve. Um, so I would I would just encourage, and, and that's part of the, the power of the peer program is over is working to overcome those stigmas because you see what um, the amazing things that people can do and and overcome. And um, so I just want to put that out there. It's a complicated situation we're in, and some of it is there's successful programs that just don't that also um, that are in need of new homes that can't find them. So um, thank you again. This was a wide ranging. Uh, public public comment session tonight and I appreciate it anybody else Lang Green. all right that takes us to tonight's uh, consent cal calendar approval I need a motion move approval second any questions comments or polls I've got a comment and I yes I would like to pull uh, 4-H for separate action and comment 4-H all right uh, anyone else all right, so I was going to um, comment on item 4D, which is the approval of a resolution tonight authorizing an interagency agreement with the Department of Commerce for a grant to complete a regional housing action plan. This is actually one of those things you highlight because it's great news uh, that with the uh, passage of House Bill 1923 last year, the legislature approved... Um, grant money for cities to develop a regional approach for housing action planning. And so we went together with Lake C and Tumwater and uh, to develop a housing action plan that will include uh, a housing needs assessment, uh, it's, which much, must result in a projection of housing needs by various income levels. So it actually matches what we have available in our housing stock versus what we can, uh, what we need based on what people make. So it's a really, really um, innovative way to look at housing, and I'm really excited that we're going to be doing it not just in the city, but in Lacey and Tumwater as well. So I just wanted to point that out. One other thing that we're going to have as a tool as we look at addressing our crisis here. Uh, and then item 4, I'm sorry, was that 4B? 4, 4 H. Not even close. 4 H. <laughs> uh, we're going to pull for separate action. Oh. <laughs> and... So that is approval of a resolution authorizing a multifamily housing tax agreement between the City of Olympia and the Lorana. So we are going to go ahead and act on the motion that's been seconded exclusive of item 4H. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. We're going to um, now, uh, I need a motion to approve item 4H. I need a second. Second. Um, all in favor say aye. Wait, wait. Oh, you have to speak. Oh, just my quick comment is I'm, I'm registering a no vote on the multifamily housing tax agreement between the city and the Lorana project. Um, just as a, as a vote saying, I believe we should move away from using multifamily tax exemption for housing projects that don't include affordable housing. And uh, Council Member Madrone. And I just want to make sure that people are aware that this is a policy that's in place right now. And our job in terms of the multifamily tax exemption is quasi-judicial. We are, um, we're, it, this is not the moment where we would change that policy. And that conversation is going to be taking place on the land use committee this year. So I just want to make sure that folks are aware. Oh, thanks for putting that out there. All right. All good. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. All right. Motion passes. Uh, with no further um, or no other business on this evening's agenda, we're going to go straight to uh, reports. I'll, all I have for the mayor's report is that we will not be having a regular business meeting next Tuesday, so there will not be an opportunity for public comment. Uh, we will be meeting, um, or the Transportation Policy Board will be meeting at 6 p.m. Uh, that's all I got. Any questions? All right. I'll go to my right, Councilmember Madrone. Nothing to report. Okay. Councilmember Rollins. Nothing to report. Councilmember Gilman. Well, I've got a couple things. Ah. Uh, I know. Everybody wants to go home. <laughs> um, first, Thurston Regional Planning Council is doing an online survey and inviting you to participate. Uh, tell us what you think about the regional transportation plan. We're looking at what kind of a road network should we be building thinking 25 years ahead? What does that mean about mass transit? What does that mean about autonomous vehicles? What's your best guess? What are your priorities now? So the, um, the website is trpc.org backslash RTP. And on that same portal, 
there is all of our most recent demographic information about Thurston County and the current transportation plan. So if you want to geek out a little bit about the future, there's an opportunity. Um, Inner City Transit met last week and um, still excited about the fare free, getting some great comments, including from Assistant City Manager Keith Staley. We got a great customer comment about riding the uh, fare free bus to a new place. Um, we, um, we began, uh, the next piece of the expansion is to think about North Lacey and how people who get jobs in those distribution centers up there might get back and forth to work. We're planning a new route. We're gonna number Route 65 and looking at some of the, the alignments for that route. So moving forward with expanding the, the area of service, um, Inner City Transit participated in the cold weather, cold blue, by off having both vans and buses available to move folks between sheltering locations. Um, and it was an exciting night. Once a year, we donate, from Inner City Transit, we donate surplus van pool vans to local community organizations. And um, we did uh, four organizations, one to Kokua, one to Coastal Community Action Program, who I learned this week actually has a West Olympia branch doing services for developmentally disabled people. Um, I had no idea they came in from the harbor to do that. The uh, Waya Outdoor Institute and Veterans for Suicide Prevention. Those were the recipients of the vans this year. It was a great uh, little ceremony. And the last thing is that last Thursday evening, Land Use and Environment met um, it was the first time to meet in a newly constituted committee with Council Member Danny Madrone and Mayor Pro Tem uh, Jessica Bateman uh, joining me on the committee. We reiterated our priority about um, doing what we can to create more housing that falls between sort of public housing, very heavily subsidized housing and the most expensive and fancy housing. How do you get privately financed housing that fits in that middle? Um, we want to continue to put special effort on accessory dwelling units, single room occupancy, what kinds of different structures like backyard cottages um, might we encourage and facilitate? And we, we received a report and, and we're going to recommend that they move on and it, it comes to council of a number of efficiencies that staff in the community planning and development department saw as opportunities to look at processes and procedures that might help out project applicants, either to better understand the process or to move more quickly through it. So that was, that was an exciting conversation. Um, and then in our, um, we had the, the published work plan that, that you've all had access to, and there's one tweak we made, and that's to move up in the calendar the review of the historic city hall and fire station, 108 State Avenue, to consider what the next use of, is of that space. So welcome to both of you to land use, and it's gonna be a great year. All right, thanks for that report. Any questions for Council Member Gill? All right, Mayor, Pre Mayor Pro Tem Bateman. I have one item to report, which is just that Council Member Parsley cannot be here tonight, but she did ask me to float the idea of coming back with a referral to the general government committee for a humane pet ordinance. So I'm just looking for consensus amongst my colleagues that she has the funds up to do that. And then politely asking the chair of general government, Renata Rollins, if you think that you can get that on your work schedule. Yes, I think we can. Okay, great. I'll let her know. And so she will be bringing back a referral to the general government committee meeting at our next regularly scheduled council meeting on February 4th. Thank you. Great, and thanks for writing that up. All right, Council Member Cooper. Thank you, Mayor Selby, just one item. Uh, we had finance uh, last week. We also had a new committee with the mayor joining us, so a little bit of a shakeup. It was a good meeting, uh, uh, though just one item, which was our work plan. So we got that tight, and you should see it on consent and an upcoming meeting. So thank All you right. very much. Thank you, happy happy to be part of the team. Oh, uh, yeah. It's a very, very busy schedule, so um, talk to me before you refer something to finance. Whoa. Drawing the line in the sand. All right. Interim City Manager Jay Burney. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have nothing to report. All right. With no further business before the Olympia City Council, we're adjourned. <laughs>